Feedback by RQK, Chapter 8, Baroque. The plugs of the bass guitar strings reverberated around the school's practice room without a particular pattern. Applejack idly played through several notes across several octaves at several different pitches, unsure if any of it would make it for a decent song. The human glanced at her other friends. Rarity sat in front of her laptop and switched back and forth between her My Stable page and some rough sketches from a very dark gallery. Horace sat next to her, attentively scrutinizing each new design that her best friend showed her, piping up with an occasional question. Pinkie Pie held an ear over her the sets near her drum, sticking the drum head with one hand and adjusting the knob with the other. The door burst open and Rainbow Death stepped into the room. Nope! Nothing. She announced. The rest of them collectively groaned. Apple's axe fingers slipped across some strings, producing a tonal shriek. Why in the hey hasn't Sunset come back yet? I spent three days with that sake! First axe tried. Maybe she just a little more time home? Rainbow Dash dropped to the floor. You'd think she'd at least find a way to tell us that if she did that. The portal's still open! She says she opened her own laptop. I said Rarity frowned. I guess that means we can't exactly invite to them. Firesight shook her head. We could always go through it, but, well, where would we look? This ain't looking too good. Applejack agreed. Well, I don't think we can really practice without her. Rainbow Dash said, clicking a key on her keyboard and prompting a small ditty. Applejack grinned. <laughs> so, let's say, you're just going to play some hoof flop, man? Rainbow Dash deadpan. Ahem. Fuck me some mod. Applejack smiled before returning to her bass guitar, now trying for a particular pattern. Things may come and things may go. Some go fast and some go slow. Few things last, that's all I know. The notes flowed in and out of each other. The rest of the room slowed down as a result. The notes that came afterwards, on the other hand, jumbled together in no coherent mess. She briefly tried to return to the tune from before, but found her as her granddad had escaped her fingers the second time around. I'm still worried about her, she said. Like, well, this never comes back. First, I folded her hands together and stared at the reflective tiles of the floor. I sure wouldn't like to lose her, too. Pinkie Pie threw herself onto the judge set. Yeah, she said with a frown. That'd be the worst thing ever. I hate not being able to do anything about it, Verity added. Rainbow Dash snorted. <laughs> the only thing we can do is wait. Applejack crossed her arms and nodded. She returned her gaze to the window. Gosh, sunlight. I hope you're safe. Rainbow Dash wiped the sweat off her brow and threw the shovel headfirst into the sand. She tried to wipe the coat of perspiration over the rest of her body, but with each drop she threw off, a new one formed in its place. The salt water, 50 feet from where they had dug, looked increasingly desirable. Something hit her on the back of her head. Ow! Hoofbeer shook his head. Hey, don't even think about the lassie. Rainbow Dash snarled. I'm not, okay? Jeez! Hoofbeer and Gaffard, for glancing down the hole before them, was as easily to say the length of his ship in death. He, too, wiped the sweat off his brow before placing his large tricorn onto the back of its rifle place on his head. Yo, we be earning a break. Rainbow Dash fell backwards onto the sand and looked out to the sea. I just hope Jules having more luck than we are. Hoofbeer sat back as well. I reckon we are. We have one of those treasures already now. And hopefully by the end of the day we will get two more. I'm just glad they can go down for me. Diving is cool, but not to the bottom of the entire ocean. She paused. I would have done it too. She added. The captain took in a deep breath of the thick and salty air, fixed his gaze on the blue skies up above. He briefly tried to pair a pelican as it soared in the idle circles above them, before the crash of a wave broke him from his daze. His attention meandered to a pair of coconuts hanging off a nearby palm tree. I've been doing a wee bit of thinking, he half muttered as he stood up and tried over to the tree. Huh? Rainbow Dash asked. I have a query, you see. There's something I be. He gave the tree a hard, sharp kick and caught the coconut that fell, wondering about. 
Shoot! You say she already be dead. But your honest quest says you reckon you can save the last. But I be thinking, where did ye get all these treasures? He pauses as he searched a nearby rock. Tell none. Sell all the souls dead. Ye get all these treasures. Ye return home. And then nothing happens. What were you do then? Rainbow Point. Scratched the back of her head. Well... Say you turns out you could not have ever done it. Wolfbeard shook his head. Even if you find all your treasures, even if you scrounge up every little thing you can out of them, you still be going home to a dead mare. Rainbow Dash crossed her four legs, tapped her hoof against the dirt. I hadn't even thought of that, really. That's an uncool idea. What would you do? Yeah, before tapping the shovel against the coconut, breaking in two. I don't know. Where would I be if we don't pull this off? Rainbow Dash took a long whiff of the salted air as he ran th thought through her head over and over again. The corner of her muzzle curled into a grin. Yeah, I'd be right where I am now, wouldn't I? See, Hoofy? See again. The way I see it, there ain't no way I could be any worse off. Because I'm there already. I've been there, done that. Raymond has stood up and poked out her chest with a huge cheeky grin. So, if there's a chance that I could turn that crap around, then I'll take it. I'll always make that choice. Hoofbeard flashed a toothy grin. Then, that'd be a good enough reason for me. I'll see this thing through ye, coconut. Raymond Dash blinked before taking the split nut and nectar spark contained within. Hoofbeard held half of it to her in an offering. She nodded, You yeah, know it! Spike chuckled to himself. The mare beside him nearly skipped through the halls of the castle. In fact, he almost mistook her for her all right floating. In sort of order, his steps started to match. He fell into full laughter. <laughs> I'm guessing it went really well, huh? Says his simmer giggle. <laughs> you bet it did. I'm really glad that I went. That's great! He exclaimed as he rounded the corner. A hallway full of doors meeting him. Most of which Spike knew to be locked. One opening, however, consisted of a set of crisscrossing metal bars that straddled in its entirety. Oh, great. Sunset growled. Her ears folded back as she narrowed her brow. Spike grinned and held up a golden option. I have the key! Sunset frowned. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. Chuckling, Spike placed the key into the steel lock and turned it once. It clicked loudly, and the gate swung all good with a metallic shriek. The mare and the dragon stepped into the room. Even with the colorful selection of tomes and scrolls on shelves, already in the hourglass in the middle, the amount of brown and ruins struck him first. Just looking at it made him yawn, and he had to fight a sudden heavy feeling in his eyes. And then he sneezed, twice even. He looked around once more and ran his fingers across the shelves, streaking through a thin layer of dust on the surface. Okay, he said, squeezing the clinging dust off. If I remember right, the time spell that we used is over on that shelf over there. The two crossed to the library, to the shelf in question, to which Sunset used her magic to grab a rolled up piece of parchment off the top. So he glanced at it quizzically, shook her head before replacing it and missed the others. The second and third turned out to be negative as well. On the fourth, she landed on a tree. Hmm. Find it? He asked. Sunset chuckled. <laughs> no. This isn't it, actually. I didn't know you couldn't do that with gravity. Spike laughed. <laughs> yeah. Sunset searched for a few more before she exclaimed, Ah! Here it is. Spike gave it to her toothy grin. Cool! You have the time spell now! Sunset gave a cursory glance over the contents. Huh. This is neat. I thought this spell would be more complicated, although... She ran her eyes down the page again. This looks like it's just a modified teleportation spell at its core. Spike shrugged. Really? Yeah. Okay. Since it tangled, <laughs> well, mind you, this is still a pretty complex spell by normal standards. But, eh, this is false play compared to the spell we're playing together. Spike grunted, saw his hand to the air. Speaking of spells, though, I've been thinking. Looks like the spell you and Twilight put together is really, like, all over the place. Twilight's good, but I'm not sure she's that good. Sunset rolled her eyes. Oh. So probably just precast it. Sprite raised an eyebrow. Uh, what? Precasting, you know. Sprite frowned. Sunset groaned and slapped her forehead. 
How do you not know what precasting is? Spike deadpan. Well, duh! Dragons don't use magic! Mayor scoffed. He only pulled her own face off. Fine, whatever. Precasting. She took a moment to take a deep breath and twiddle her mane. Most of the time when you do magic, you perform the spell as you cast it. So he explained. Most spells are pretty simple. So anyways, regular casting is the most convenient. Plus, you can chase it up on the fly. But with precasting, you build the entire spell beforehand. Then you cast it. So, it's kind of like you're putting it out before you perform it, right? Exactly. You can change the spell however you want. But the cast is, once you cast, you have to commit to the entire life of whatever you made. The Dragon Knight. Mm, okay, I see. I guess that'd be useful for something that big, huh? Yep. So says turn, hurrying attention to the time travel spell. It's also the basis for computational magic. So I guess, oh, that! He's going, stabbing his fingers. That's number 22! Now I get... Uh-huh. So, like for this one. Sunset flared her horn, and concentrated on the scroll in front of her. Above her head, a ball of light appeared, containing a patterned maelstrom of ethereal energy. The swirls turned to steep blobs at first, but as Sunset concentrated, the states that orbited around the core became more jagged, more robust, and more diversified in their construction. All I have to do is touch my horn to this, and I'll be on my way to the pass. But, that wouldn't be a good idea, Spike thought. He pointed at the scroll. Yeah, uh, you might want to read that. Sunset buried her face into the scroll again. She read from the top to the bottom as per her spell floating above her head, ready for casting. You can only do this spell once per lifetime, she murmured, paring a line off the bottom. So once I perform this, I won't be able to do it again. The ball of energy floated above her head, fizzed out bit by bit, and quietly died. Sunset chuckled and nervously swallowed. So... When I do perform the time spell, I'll have to make this count then. <laughs> the dragon crossed her arms and stared her down. The floor thumped to the, to the tabs of his foot. The mayor turned to seed rare. Sorry, I wasn't going to cast it anyways. I just wanted to show precasting, that's all. She so held it for a leg and saying, Didn't mean to worry you. Spike sighed and shrugged. It's okay. Sunset looked at the scroll one last time. Then he used her magic to roll it up. Listen, Spike. I have a favor to ask you. Okay. Well, you're on today. After we've done today's work, can you take Twilight and give me the tower for an hour or two? I... I need to do some serious thinking, and I kind of would like to place it myself. Spike turned toward the door, motioning with his arm for her to follow. I could probably do that. Although, what do you want us to do? Says it tried behind him. I don't know, just whatever. All I need is the tower. Spike tried out through the entryway and looked down the hall. Sure, okay. I'll find something for the both of us to do. Sunset used her magic to set the door behind him. Do you have any idea what you'll do? Spike placed the key into the lock and turned it once. Then he looked up to her with a smile. Yeah, I got something in mind. Being if I glanced up at the cliff face in front of her. Ran a hole through the dyed dirt underneath her hooves as he looked at the steep grade. It had to be at least thrice the height of Sugar Cube Corner. Her gaze fixed itself on a sizable hole in the face. She rubbed her chin as she thought about how to get up to that very hole. Well, it had to be half up way to face by its measurements. She noticed a disturbing lack of footholds in the opening as well. It's in here? She asked. Stone Obelus nodded sagely, pressing some dust off his lapel. Yes, over your stone and that being guardian are in there. Pinkie Pie nodded. Well, here we are then. This is it. Sonobos raised his eyebrow. The other line. Pinkie Pie narrowed eyes and smirked. My entire last four days have led to this moment. Sonobos reached into his cell bag and pulled out a purple orb. Well, in that case, you want this. Pinkie Pie grinned. She placed the stone into her cell bag, replacing it with another object. It was large, circular, but somehow bigger than the cell bag itself. Pinkie Pie threw her trampoline so it was right below. Stone Obelisk looked in abject horror as the Pink Point procured a large and curly musical instrument out the very same magical bag. She carefully placed the sousaphone on the ground. He dusted his glasses once. They took them all to clean them. And 
after replacing them on his face. He played several times. Then mumbled something about buying new ones. I bet them because I knew I would need them. Think he is fine. Yes, I can see that. Ah, I think I'll need to complicate everything I've ever known after witnessing that. Pinkie Pie hopped him on the nose. He's just a saddlebag, silly. He deadpan. And I'll have to dedicate the rest of my life to understanding that saddlebag of yours. After I sell you stones. Pinkie Pie giggled. <laughs> I must say, he said, stringing his collar. This has been very engaging. Very glad to have come upon this small adventure with you. He smiled at his pith. Where were you, Pinkie Pie? With that, the earphone turned and trotted off into an opening in the rocks behind him. His hostess faded into the distance, and soon enough, all traces of him left the scene together. Pinkie Pie looked between the sousaphone and trampoline, then to the opening in the cliff face, imagining what sort of creature laid inside. But then again, she would find her final stone, if successful. Crystal ball in hand, Spike rattled through the dessert so of the city. He wandered in that direction, delving around corners purely on whim. Then again, even after living at Ponyville for so many years, Canterlot was like the back of his hand. Several memories of several places he had gone with to Twilight took their turn in his head. Without command, his feet worked to take him there. Within the image sewn inside the crystal ball, Twilight Sparkle slumped against the desk as he poured a concoction out of one vial into another. A small puff of smoke erupted as the ingredients interacted. She frowned. Well, she said, I just have to let this sit for half an hour and then I'll be able to finish this gum off. Spike glanced around another group, the community of aristocrats up and down as he passed by them. That's great! Yes, it is, she said, turning her gaze towards the window for a few moments. Polly then walked over to the chalkboard. On its front, she had drawn a diagram of a bottle, most like the twelve bottles she had sitting out to the table, labeled with instructions for a simple enchantment. She flipped that over to reveal the other side, filled with frames, calculations, diagrams, a set of half his equations on top of layers and smudged chalk. She levitated a piece of chalk up and stood in front of the board for a few moments, glancing from section to section. She then snorted, launched the chalk onto the board, and broke into two on impact, and both pieces clattered to the floor. Spike furrowed his brow. Twilight, are you okay? Twilight slumped over to the window. The mayor tried to look over at the walls of the castle, frowning deeper when it became apparent. Craning her neck to approve her view. She looked back at her wings and gave them a couple of flats before taking to the air. Even then, she couldn't keep a constant rhythm and wavered as a result. But roll out Ah She plummeted to the floor and landed in a heap. The mare growled in a heap for a few moments before she sighed defeatedly and rested against the glass. Spike ground the seat together. Twilight Twilight looked into her voice and sobbed. I can feel it, Spike. The nameless one's out. I'm fighting with every bit of my being, Spike. I'm doing everything that I can to delay it, but... She felt that some of the split ends in her mane. I just... I don't know how much longer I can hold out. Twilight. Twilight tried to reach out towards the city, but the window stopped her short. She futilely banged her head against it and let out a distressed cry. I guess I want out, too. I want to go someplace, anywhere, anywhere but here. Spike groaned and used his free hand to rub his face. He held the ball close, hoping that somehow he would travel through it. He wanted to hold her tight. No, he needed to, because she needed him. How can I help her? As Spike continued to walk through the street, he glanced at his surroundings. A thought came to him, but he shook his head. He knew her. He knew what she liked the most. Nothing in that tower would satisfy that. And he wasn't in the tower either. Spike blinked. The dragon skipped a step. was was pushed away by it. Oh! Let's into the ball and said, Hey, Twilight! I know Will's here! You look! Twilight shook her head and sniffed. What? Spike reached the corner of the street and stopped there. He looked down the adjoining streets one by one and focused on the area around him, looking for details. So, I'm standing here on the street corner, he said. And there's this smell of honey in the air. It's thick and hot, and I had this inkling to walk down the bakery down the street. I can see their sign. It's bright and it's got gold lettering. And so every other sign seems small compared to that. And many nights from years ago, when Twilight was sitting beside his bed with a book, he came rustling back. There's an older couple. 
they're hanging out in front of the shop. And they look like they're about to smash their muffins into each other's face from the way they're waving around. There's another couple watching them down their noses from the other side. And I bet they're all held dirty. The days where Twilight would dive into books, into other worlds, and not immerse until hours later. And there isn't much else happening here. There are a few other ponies around. They got all these 300-bit main cuts, and their noses are so in the air, I bet they can't see the ground. Everything else is blocky and white, and all the stores on this street sort of blend together. Twilight continued to gaze out the window, but her ears remained fixed on the ball. She sighed every sob and tried to run through her muzzle. Soon they stopped altogether. And the sun's shining, so there's no clouds in the sky. But the grass is all crunchy, because they had to cancel some weather a few days ago. They'll make it out tomorrow, though. There's this constant whistle from the wind as it goes through the buildings. Spike looked at the air and sexy and nodded, before we're assuming down the streets. That's my street corner. Twilight continued to stare out the window, but now she was completely silent. She sat still for a few moments, almost unresponsive. And then, the smallest crack of a smile graced her muzzle. Did that help? Spike asked. Twilight chuckled and wiped away a tear. It sure did, Spike. That was beautiful. I really needed that. Thank you. It was nothing, Twilight. You're really good at it, though. I think you'd made Jade Singer proud. Spike blushed. <laughs> well, that's what happens when I write all your letters for you. Twilight snickered and rolled her eyes. Sure. <laughs> Spike shrugged and glanced up at the street and smiled to himself. He gave himself a mental pack on the back. The encore mare looked out the window. Without even looking, she levitated her own crystal ball over to her and clutched it to her chest. Spike looked down. Even though her crystal ball still seemed as impossible white to him, she could see something. I guess it was still the rock cavern. She could hear the voices when they talked. But that was the full extent of their interaction. I'm sure she could use something other than just our voices, he thought. I wanted to ask Spike and Stunza if she could do something about that. Spike? Spike looked down. Yeah. Twilight clutched her crystal ball tightly. Can you explain what more for me? Spike grinned. Sure. Sunset brushed aside another object and let out an Aha! Using her magic, she fixed the box of candles out and then backed away from the cupboard. Finally, I found you. She whirled and grabbed a pair of bowls from the tabletop before ascending the stairs. Thousands of books stared down at her as she reached the top. Paid them no mind. The mare tried over to the hourglass and let to set her items down but paused. She looked at the spot before her, where a pair of incense rods and a pillow laid waiting before she turned to gaze the sprawling window behind the hourglass. With a chuckle, she levitated every item to the other side of the glass and... After giving Celestia's Tower a smile, Sunset sat. She stood beside the six of incense and candles around her, took a deep breath, adjusted one of the candles, then flared her horn. The objects flickered to life. A dull flame stood on the tip of the candle, while a small, steady stream of smoke waited off the incense. She took a long whiff of the wooden smell, let out a long, wistful sigh. The human world just didn't compare. When has she last to teeth to set up? Sunset smiled. Probably just before my last midterm under Princess Celestia, huh? Sunset took one last look at her setup, took a long whiff of the burning incense, then closed her eyes. The rest of the tower melted away. The low hum of the wind against the walls faded, and shortly after her, the procession of black did so as well. Peace. Quiet. Tranquility. Sunset took a deep breath and opened her eyes. An eternal plane of cold sessing reds and oranges greeted her instead. Sunset peered across the idle expanse of her own mind and smirked. All right, Sunset thought. Let's review the facts. We're dealing with the prospect of parallel worlds, worlds just like this one. One staggered nine days from the other. A small, disembodied flame appreciated into the air in front of her. The flame danced for a moment as an image found its way around its body, showing a crystal ball with a large number nine painted across the front. Sunset watched as the flame started to orbit around her head. We don't have any proof yet that this is the case. This was just a possibility that we thought up. If this is not the case, then we will eventually retrieve the information that's in the book right now. She watched the flame as it circled around and furrowed around. 
and if we are unable to reproduce the information in the book, or the Twilight can't reproduce those sets of coordinates, then we'll have to prove that this parallel world theory is the case. We'll know either way within the next couple of days. And that's this one world. Then our course of action is clear. The crystal ball within the number nine paused in front of her. Sunset grabbed the flame out of the air. But not with the parallel world theory. She tossed the flame back into the expanse. Where it exploded into a million pieces. Bathing the immediate surroundings in a glittery coat of embers. So, she thought. Let's just pretend for a moment that she is in a parallel world. So set drive forward. Probably the first question I should ask is where do they differ from each other? One of the embers in front of her face mutated, taking the form of a brand new flame. This one contained the image of a clock. Another question would be, what role the crystal ball plays in all this? Another ember burst. This one hosted the image of a plain crystal ball. And then there's the matter of discrepancies in the book. A new flame with an inequality sign appeared. Sunset turned to the clock. Let's start with you. If the worlds are really divergent, then what capacity? If it's just like the coordinates like Twilight said, then could there be possible divergence earlier? She scratched her chin and thought and shook her head. No. Up until the discrepancy with the coordinates, the worlds that followed each other. That could be proven by the time limit despite costs, since that depends on both worlds coinciding. The flame containing the clock wriggled and writhed as the image within chains. The new picture took the form of Spike's disembodied head, overlaid by a circular symbol. The flame began to orbit around her head. She narrowed her eyes. But wait, she thought. If that's the case, then that raises another question. If Twilight is in a parallel world, how did we get a package from her through the hourglass? The flame within a box appeared, swirling around her head just as Spike's flame did. She kept her attention on it, then turned her gaze to the flame containing the crystal ball. If I want to enter that, she thought, I'll have to figure this out. She mentally called the flame in close. She was to grab at it and chuckled it between her hose. In terms of communication between our world and hers, it's hilariously left sighted. We could see her and hear her, and we could even look anywhere else to boot, but she can only hear us. An eye and ear versus an ear. Information is somewhat one way because of that. Why is this important? Because our Twilight had to receive the same set of instructions from as theirs did. From somewhere. Another version of us? How could that be? If the ball operates the same between worlds, then what she should see is nine days into her past. That's 18 days behind us. Several flames banded together and produced an arrow. So that means at one point, our twilight was at the end of that arrow, and naturally, another version of us was at the other end of that arrow, just like we were at the head of another arrow and their twilight was at their end. We talked to their twilight and we and they talked to ours. An arrow mutated into two arrows, each crisscrossing each other. Twilight stared at the flame for a few moments, examining her mental diagram. Then she snorted and slapped down with her hoof. No, that's not possible, she thought. The flame disintegrated. The former arrow materialized in its place. That would cause a time loop of the wrong sort. A new flame appeared, showcasing two parallel lines, popped into the beam beside the arrow. How can I light this arrow so that both lines are the same? For what seemed like an eternity, Sunset stared at the two flames, gritting her teeth together all the while. She tried to jam the arrow in between the two lines, but found each permutation disgracefully asymmetric. She allowed the arrow flame to engulf the box flame. The resulting fire grew, even brighter than the one before it. Sunset attempted to curve the flames, but they continued onwards. Instead, she tried jamming the arrow again. After a few more unsuccessful attempts, she frowned. Okay, let's try this. Sunset duplicated the arrow. She placed both arrows between the lines in front of her, each in opposing directions. The design didn't click. But one of these arrows makes sense. She thought. So he played around with the second arrow, trying to make it fit. The arrow has to point to a place nine days before it. Whatever arrow comes off of that has to at one point spot nine days before it, and then has to have to point into spot time nine days before that. But if it's just arriving back on itself indefinitely, that's not possible. There's nowhere to, for it to go between the two worlds. It can only work if... Sunset paused. If... 
Sunset looked over her mental diagram. The second arrow rotated in place as she considered her options. She moved it to outside for a diagram, so it touched the tail end of the first arrow. Only then did she see some semblance of symmetry. Sunset backpelled. If there's a third line. The two lines became three. And Sunset slid the second arrow between them. She frowned. Okay. But now that third line is missing something. I think I had to do the same thing with this. The third arrow appeared. She stuck it down to the tail end of the second. Sunset frowned before bringing out a fourth line. Now the fourth one is off. I need a fifth and a sixth and... Sunset so Simmer felt a drop of sweat run down her face. No way. She stared at daggers into her diagram and her teeth. There will never be enough lines. There will never be enough worlds. Simmer ran down Sunset's spine. So, basically, the big takeaway from this is that there are definitely many worlds, and they're all connected through that crystal ball. With that, she took the crystal ball within her hose and threw it forward. The meal skill fire transformed into a raising inferno, a large glowing infinity symbol in the dead air. So hot was the idea Sunset could feel it since her coat. There are definitely many worlds below us. There are definitely many worlds above us. She ran a hoof through her curly hair. Oh, fucking buck. What the fuck? The mayor ran her eyes over the large fart in place before her, a worry expressed on her face. Briefly, she retreated into herself. Curling up into the ball in the middle of the expanse. Get together, Sunset, she cried to herself. Get together. You should have known that this was possible after reading about Omnithirst theory. Sunset right herself let out a long sigh. <sighs> okay, okay. If it whirls, and they only differ by the coordinates we were sent to. Why do the coordinates differ? A new flame, this one containing a set of numbers, appeared. The inequality symbol from earlier, Food Thorf, began to mingle with it. It's safe to assume that the nameless in our world is the same nameless in all of theirs. Otherwise, we will have had some serious divergence going on. So, it's safe to assume that the data we'll find in our world is the same as what we can find in theirs. Since it placed a hoof on her chin. But, why the difference? What determines what stones we go after? Since it thought back to what she had seen in the book. She knew it contained several sets of parameters for searching for the stones. There was also a long list of coordinates. A good number in each had been crossed out. Large but docile flame flowed into existence, sowing the into both of them. She so examined the picture within. We're collecting twelve. We could reasonably say that they will collect a different twelve below us. Could it be reasonable to assume that they have collected a third set of twelve above us? Says it blinked. And we're all connecting different pieces to the same puzzle. A flame containing a puzzle piece appeared. If that's the case, the differences of which stones we're chasing are completely arbitrary. The entirety of the stones will eventually be collected. And eventually, all the information will exist. Scared, maybe, but it will exist. If all that information was ever in one place, we'd be able to write the answer, right? The docile flame fizzled into a much smaller one with a question mark. So, how do I access this infinite network of information? The smaller flames began to orbit around a raising inferno of the infinity symbol. Sunset watched as they whirled around faster and faster, and before long she could hardly tell any two apart. Sunset watched, slice sawed, as the speeding eye slowly closed in on the inferno. They hit. The inferno had engulfed them before growing into a monster of a fire. Sunset had to seal her eyes for a moment as it raised at its highest capacity. The inferno suddenly shrunk down to the size of a hoof, smaller and stiffer than all the other flames before it, but unlike the rest of them, the fire grew a bright blue color, against the fire red background of the expanse. The blue flame every bit of her wandering attention. Sunset crept up to it, sucked in her breath, and grabbed at the blue fire. The flame in her hoof exploded and engulfed her. Sunset's body disintegrated. The rest of the expanse followed suit. Eureka! Sunset's eyes flew open. The rest of the tower greeted her. The sounds had crept up to different places in the room where she had gone under. Quick look down revealed the wrinkling entails of spending scents, called forms in the candle basis. Celestia's former pupil stood up with a huff. <laughs> I know what to do now. Rarity looked up at the sun and pressed some dirt off her side of her mane. I still have paid the extra bits for the cot, she thought. She placed the open bottle on the ground next to her 
before reaching to her saddlebag for a handkerchief. The embroidery edging tore in several places, and the dirty body looked browner than it did in snake of white. Rarity let out a dejected wheeze, reached back into her saddlebag, found no alternatives. Oh my, this really is my last one, isn't it? She thought. She levitated the cloth near her dirty pants on the underside of her neck, paused, then decided the cloth was somehow dirtier than she was. Ew! She said with a look of disgust. The flight coughed t once and shook her head. I am going straight to the spa when I get home, she thought aloud. What if the princess knows any good places to? A loud zap! Pierced the air as a purple ball shot out of the mud, interrupting her train of thought as it unceremoniously splashed her. She shrieked as it hit her coat and she reeled back, only to start to throw up mud. Disgusting! Randy looked up at the glowing orb above her and a dazzling display of sparks. A magical aura held the stone in place for many moments, allowing Rarity to position herself on her knees. She winced. Goodness, how long has that stone been underground for all that dirt? She then looked over the warm cloth in her magical grass. She guessed, <gasps> Idea! Just as the magic spell dissolved, and the stone began to drop, Rarity glided the handkerchief underneath. The stone landed in the dead center of the fabric. Rarity pulled with her magic. Scooping the entire stone out of the air. She got out of the affirmative. Oh! She levitated the whole package back into her saddle bag. Without so much as even a glance, she then physically pulled out a small purple spear. The hard object shined against the radius of the sun. Had it really come time to chew on the teleportation gum? Rarity chuckled, eyeing the object. Took one last look at the cliffs around her. One sour glance at the muddy ground beneath her. Indeed, I am digging now! The unicorn popped to come into her mouth and chewed down, an explosion of a flavor that couldn't place cascaded through her muzzle. The air she coursed through her body, in a short order, she swallowed her whole. She could feel the entire being being torn apart, bit by bit, and yet it didn't hurt. Her entire world twisted and distorted and collapsed on itself. She had one last thought. Hmm, I wonder if anybody else has encountered anything unsavory at their sights. My, what a trouble it would be. Marcel attentively set the lantern down and reached into her saddlebags. Her eyes darted around the various tunnels, sneaking off from the large cavern she stood in. She swallowed. She could barely see in front of her face, let alone clearly tell which tunnels went where. Or, if they even existed for that matter. The telltale dispressions of their mouths were her only clue of their whereabouts. A screech shot forth from one of the adjoining tunnels. The Pegasus winced under the sound of it and whipped her attention back toward the ground. Still nothing. Her hoof bumped against something round in her bag, and yanked it out in a heartbeat. The teleportation gum shone against the lantern's light. A cascade of cries and shrieks, the cacophony of rushing air burst from the tunnel. A drop of sweat ran down her face as she grabbed treat. Come on, please, she muttered. She flipped the teleportation gum in her hoof several times, as she stared on the spot on the ground. She hoped the lantern wouldn't decide to die. The house became more voluminous, like they were mummy. Where's I begin pawing at the ground? Please come faster, please come faster, please, 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 come faster. With a loud boom, the ground heaved, sending debris in all directions. The stone sounded out words, bathed in a shower of sparks, and for the moment of its apex, floated there. First I gasped. Finally, she thought, without a second thought. She popped a piece of gum and positioned herself underneath the stone. In the darkness, a set of red eyes appeared and moved against the backdrop. With every passing second, dozens of more followed behind them. The cries grew in an increasing number as they emerged. The sparks fizzled and the stone fell into her outstretched hoof. First I bit down. The gum exploded, and the base's entire body dissolved into a series of green-colored flames. The fires banded together and sealed through the air, disappearing toward the exit. Applejack charged headlong into another pass of grass before she dared to crane her neck toward what ran behind her. Several marsupials, covered from head to toe in hair, thundered behind her, hurling high pits and primal screams at her. Their rugged and redded faces slipped between expressions of rage and bewilderment, but in both cases they glared down at her through beady eyes. Applejack groaned, How in the heck did I get into this mess? She looked back forward to focus herself on outpacing them. Her saddle bag's loose buckle flapped open with each step, and the contents tumbled out. At times, they dug into her side, and she attempted to shrug them off each time. 
but the pounding began to pile up. As she tarred through the long and yellow stalks of grass, she craned her neck to look over their tops. The path ahead appeared to thin out ahead of her. She leaped into the air for a bare fan's point. Rather, the whole earth dropped off altogether. She paled. Applejack dug her hooves into the dirt as she landed. The dirt rebounded under her hooves, and for a moment she skid. Then her hoof caught onto something in the ground, and Applejack fell face first into the dirt. She felt something sent in her saddlebag. A speeding glint caught her eyes. She looked up. Her one remaining glass vial, containing Twilight's Stonefinder spell, flew through the air in front of her. But to dismay, Gravity took hold and shared and landed the ball into the ground. Zap! With this ball, and Applejack watched as the ball of electricity hung in the air. The baboons behind her stood by in an enraptured gaw at the spell twisted and cackled about. Any trace of their malevolence eroded from their features. A few even raced out at some of the sparks that arced in the direction. The cow pony lowered her steps to block out the view. Now that the ball was broken, the spell was cast. If there was one thing Applejack knew from the instructions, the spell had a range. Applejack gulped, I'm not where I lead the play. The vortex surged once, twice, and then for a moment dimmed. No, rather, unlike the last time, when the spell had rocketed into the ground, this one fizzed in midair. Several loose fragments flew away in the breeze as it disassembled itself. The spell disintegrated until only its core remained. Then after a few moments later, it disappeared with a dim flash of white light. A cool wind swept through the area, passing several decaying leaves through and around all of them. Everything else stayed still and silent. An eternity pressed past him. Applejack slowly throws to her hose. I failed. Applejack whirled around to face the baboons, who returned their attention to her in kind. I failed. One of the baboons screamed. Their serene picture quickly dissolved into a party of streaks and cries from the floor. Several pounded their hands to the dirt, and bared their fangs, and made several lunges toward her, but never went all the way. Applejack retreated, step by step, step by step, the line of marsupials ends forward. Applejack's hind hoof pierced through the earth, sending several rocks tumbling into the gorge far below. Applejack cranced and pulled it back. Whoa, man! She grabbed her hat and looked between the mob in front of her and the drop behind her. She grit her teeth. It looks like I'm finished. Applejack cautiously reached in and grabbed the orange piece of gum, keeping her eye eyes trained on the pack all the while. The fumbled her step on her saddle back, managing to pull it tight. She took one last look down the earth below and swallowed. Applejack whirled once more, then left off the edge of the cliff, just as the baboon surged forward. She quickly wrapped her free roof around her stetson to keep her from blowing away as she pummeled it down the side of the face. But even then, she threw the gum into her mouth, listened around to look one last look at the baboons, and piled up against the edge of the cliff, like they expected her to hit firing. She considered it, but remembered the stone in her bag. I'm sorry, Twilight. I failed you. Elsack bit down, then exploded to a plethora of green embers that the wind scooped up and carried away. Sunset gazed down toward the sun through the first floor balcony. For a moment, she rested her four legs on the balcony and pondered the rest of the sky. She frowned. We have a storm schedule for tomorrow, don't we? She thought Rain could easily get in here with this opening balcony. Hmm. Sunset flared her horn and fired a short, weak bolt of out of the opening. However, the bolt rebounded against an invisible wall and struck the floor beside her instead. The mayor glanced down at the small mark left in the floor and chuckled. <laughs> well, she thought. At least that still works. The large double blue doors behind her creaked open, and Sunset whirled around. Spike, you're back! The dragon skipped through the opening. You bet! Any luck? He asked, with a scratching voice as he presented the ball. Sunset used her magic to take it from him. Lots of it. I think I've made a huge breakthrough. The dragon nodded before he popped himself on the couch. Tell me about it. Albert Sunset grinned. Well, for starters... I realize we're dealing with an infinite world scenario. Spike frowned. Um. Basically, if Twilight's in her world, and we're in another world, then I think there's a third world that's watching us for nine days into the future. She explained. And then, there's a fourth one watching them, and it just goes on into infinity. Sunset whirled around and started up the stairs. And I! She beat a hoof against her chest. I'm going to make use of that fact! 
Phelps, he said. The Heiner, Spike frowned across his arms. Uh, yeah, okay, you do that! He yelled, before throwing himself onto the cushion. Sunset reached the study area, and, after taking a moment to bask in the powering push shelves, went down into the ball. The view showed the living area. She surmised that Twilight had gone down there some time before Spike had returned. She glanced around on the balcony within the ball, and then, on a whim, glanced around the room in search of Twilight. Her eyes stuck on a particular object in the room. A brown hooded cloak hung on one of the hangers. Sunset rubbed her chin perplexedly. That must be the one still wear to the door, she thought. She shrugged and willed the room view into the study area. Twilight Sparkle hunched over a chemistry book, flipping through several bookmarked pages as he glanced between it and the vials on the desk. Sunset placed her hope on the ball. Hey, Twilight. Twilight's ears twitched as she glanced up words. Hi, Sunset. Figuring anything out? Sunset nodded. Yeah, I figured a lot of stuff out. I'm going to try and access the multiverse. Twilight ran a hoof across the page. She blinked several times and took a long, deep breath. <laughs> okay, okay. Do you have a plan? It's my go for bark plan. The all or nothing. My way of getting the answer. And to make it work, I'll need a couple of things from you. The mayor stared blankly onto the page. Idly flipped the page, then glanced over at her own crystal ball. Twilight snatched her book shut and kicked it over to the desk. After swiping some loose articles out of the way, she pressed her quill against the blank note card. What do you need? Sis is smart. First things first. Do you remember the first set of coordinates that you generated? Yes. Those coordinates are correct. I want you to send them through your care packets. Twilight wrote down a single sentence on her note card. Okay, I'll do that. What else? Sunset quickly glanced around the book sales, on the, both sides of the room. Sarah on the desk area. The mask grabbed the blue sketchbook. I want you to let me copy your entire book. Twilight glanced over her journal. You mean the one I copied off of you? Yes, Sunset said, stabbing a hoof against the floor. That one. I'd like to copy that through the night. Twilight nodded. I think I get a chance to turn on the flip pages every few minutes. I'll keep the ball close by if I need to make adjustments in the night. Sunset cut their hoofs together. Great, thanks. Anything else? Sunset placed her hoof against her muzzle, looked into the crystal ball. She glanced hard at the journal, struggling her chin all the while. Yes, Sunset finally said. Just one last thing. All right, what is it? She swallowed. Twilight, do you trust me? Twilight again stepped to work with a complicated frown, distantly nodded. With my life, Sunset. Sunset sucked in her breath. Okay, so when it's all said and done, whether or not you have the answer for you or not, when it's time for you to leave, I want you to burn your journal. <laughs>